Okay, so the final topic. Uh, this is quite an interesting one as well. Um, in terms of how employers, um, you know, look for people to come into these organisations, do you feel they have a moral obligation to um, broaden access for people from diverse backgrounds um, due to historical inequities um, associated with their histories? Because sometimes I, I believe that those key problems in society is people, you know, they respect the fact, oh, slavery happened, it destabilised our community, or the Holocaust happened, it destabilised the Jewish community, but in different instances they react differently. So, for example, if someone does something um, and it's affecting the black community, they'll just brush it off as like, oh, it's a problem, but you're not really going to do much about it, we'll just let it continue. And then when people are employing people with those subconscious biases, they sometimes don't do enough in order to not allow those subconscious biases to take place in that recruitment process. But um, George, just maybe start from you, do you believe due to historical inequities that obligation then exists in order to help improve things or do you think it just doesn't, shouldn't matter? It's a great question and I have a very simple answer. For me, I say no. And the main reason why I say no is because I believe for you to get some part of employment is all to do with how good are you at your craft or whether they know whether you're willing to learn because sometimes you don't have any experience. I think those are the two, two, you know, two things that it comes down to. Everything else is important to take into consideration. Like for example, you take into consideration whether you've been in the army and they give those people jobs. You know, so it should definitely be taken into consideration. But the main factor should be whether or not you're good at a job, and that's kind of how I believe it. There's always going to be biases, and that's why you need these considerations. But I'm not sure how far you can go with it. You know, because how far do you go? Is it extended? I'm not sure. Do you have a quota? Do you have? You know, there's, there's so many ways of doing it. I think they should consider it without a doubt, but it shouldn't be the main focus. Yeah, I think with me, it's. I know a lot of people are against sort of positive discrimination because of that, but I think looking at it from the perspective of, well, certain members of society are put a step ahead because of the nature of the privilege and things like that. So, when it comes to employers um, actively, you know, doing positive discrimination, I don't see that as a bad thing. I think that is good because, you know, I'm sure we're all told when we're younger, like, okay, you, as a black child, you have to work twice as hard as your white counterparts. And as much as we don't want to believe that that is true, it is true. And so I think it's important for employers to recognise that, and that is just how the nature of society is. So I personally think that the obligation should be put on employers to um, make sure you know that recruitment processes and things are fair. But I do understand where you're coming from uh, because it's easy for a business to you know just do things to meet the diversity quotas and things like that. Um, but I suppose that's a whole different conversation. It concerns like the difference between diversity and inclusion whether you're doing it from, what, what, where it's coming from, whether you're doing it from a place or not. So, uh, ultimately, I would say that, yeah, the obligation should be placed in the place. Yeah, it's, it's just interesting to think about, like, the difference between, you know, like, doing it and having an obligation to do it. I think yeah. it's, like, a very hard line to cross. And I do agree with George's point, but there is a where, how far do you go to give the obligation? But I do believe the obligation should exist to some extent because, as I was saying, like certain people's histories, you know, if you look at it, is what what challenges have you actually faced to get into the positions you are now? Hardly any. And if you look at, you know, how up until this day a black person is more likely to be stopped and searched, I don't know by how much multiple times, but it's still likely to be stopped and searched for no reason, then people who are from different backgrounds and if you think about how society treats people disproportionately then in the recruitment process those different instances could be taken into account for example if they see you being stopped and searched and they're like oh that means there might be a problem but actually fact, no I was walking home from school and he didn't look, like, didn't look at me like how, how is that my fault and you know um, that's actually a true story by the way that's happened to me and I think 
you know, I believe that it's not the same for everyone going into these different industries and in different places, but I think the respect should be there. Um, and the obligation should be to respect the fact that, you know, people, as you said, come from different circumstances and they, you know, they face maybe more challenges, hence you should judge them by what they've achieved. It's like we discussed before, I think, what they've achieved as opposed to, you know, putting them in just the same bracket as all the other applicants that go through. Well, what should you go through? So, mm, um, I think it's a really good question, to be honest. Um, do I think they currently feel a moral obligation? No, I don't, on the whole. Should they? I think so. Um, I think it's quite difficult for us to place a moral obligation on another because it's got to come from inside. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the reason why you have places like South Africa that um, place legal obligations on people, on businesses, um, respective um, boards of directors, shareholdings, etc., etc., to fulfill certain quotas because they know that the obligation morally on its own to make those changes, to reverse those historic inequities, like you said, yeah. don't exist. Mm. So it requires them to like make that legal decision to force them to act, if yeah, that makes sense. So yeah. I think it kind of depends on the particular individual society that we're looking at. I think in the West, I think that they could take a leaf out of South Africa's book and not see it as them only making those changes and only making those laws because of apartheid and apartheid somehow to them being worse than the history of you know Britain and the US. I think what they should look at is the fact that um, whilst globally apartheid um, is condemned in a different way and largely in our society now it's because it's fresh on people's minds um, they should still look at the history that's kind of led us to this position that we're in today mm. and consider like I said taking a leaf out of their book and not necessarily just kind of acting so defensive when people bring up that, that conversation um, about possible discrimination so I mean personally I'm kind of for us having a deeper conversation about it mm. um, but I've not come to the point yet where I'm ready to make a judgment as to whether or not it's better yeah. or not. Um, yeah, it's a tough one because I don't think anybody is like entitled to a job like just because of like their social standing. Mm -hmm. Like obviously that like, I wholeheartedly believe in like diversity and inclusion as much as it's like a really corny buzzword that I'm just I'm so tired of hearing. But it's true, and I feel like I feel like companies, particularly particularly those kind of huge like you know huge companies, have an actual obligation to invest in their society because who else are they going to sell to? But nobody's in, like entitled to the role because like it's it's you, when you when you inquire for a service or whatever you want someone who's actually qualified, not someone who's just been given it because you know you feel sorry for them. And that's the thing as well. Like I hate that that feeling. I mean, not that. I feel like this happened to me, but sometimes you know you do feel a bit like, oh, am I only being employed or hired or whatever because I'm like I'm a black person and there's some black people here. So I feel like money and time is perhaps better spent investing in like in educational institutions, investing in like retraining for people who um, like whose industries are slowly falling away because of like 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 aut automation and stuff like that, yeah. automation and stuff. Um, and I feel like that's probably a better use of maybe like money because for example when I was in sixth form I was a part of like this organization called the brokerage yeah. and they ran like a, a program with the Bank of England and they they and they only hired interns from the brokerage and the brokerage specifically worked with like underrepresented um, like I guess like young people from like unconventional backgrounds yeah. and stuff and like that that worked really well and one thing they did as well they worked with like the World Bank of Canada where they would like pay for your like uni fees and blah 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 and I feel like that that stuff is is equally as good but at the same time I feel like 
a lot of this stuff is, is just a kind of bit of a waste of time as well because this isn't actually where the real issues are and I feel like a lot of the people who then go onto those programs and work in these institutions do have like a degree of privilege and you're kind of only working with like I guess like the, the cream of, of the crop whereas there's a lot of I guess young people in more hard to reach areas and places who would actually really benefit from that money being invested in them as individuals and the communities that they live in so I'm a bit I'm a bit torn because sometimes I just feel like oh this is just a big waste of time uh, but at the same time I'm also like oh actually there's a lot of value added by ensuring that your companies are are diverse but again that's only really for profit not for the better of the individual because I feel like a lot of people who then go to these companies bear in mind a lot of these roles are only entry level roles that's why like you're saying when you get to like senior leadership it's all white people because they hire like all of their interns and their junior roles will be like young aspiring like perky young people from you know inner city London who are like non-white and then they kind of just become really I guess just like dissatisfied because you've worked so hard to be accepted and in, like welcomed by these institutions who only really see your value as somebody that can make money for them and and I guess and then that kind of just turns people off anyway so I don't know I don't know I think maybe organizations should feel morally obliged to help empower people from diverse communities to sustain and, and help themselves like paying for their tuition, investing in their ideas, do you know what I mean? Like all of that stuff. Like I feel like maybe that would go a bit further than you know hiring some young know, black like people who are just gonna quit after two years because there's no room to move upwards because you don't actually plan for that. You only plan for them to be there to be represented. I don't know, a couple of is, is a, is a joke. Like, I just don't even know. Yeah, it's too I'll put a thought anyone else wants to offer any. Shante hit me in the hand for me. I was just a part of the brokerage and yeah. had an internship with an investment bank. And it, it was great, you know. I loved them, they loved me, they helped me get an internship in New York. Like, we're talking great opportunities. So I can't fault that, you know, mm. you, can't, you can't fault it at all and that helped me to give me the confidence I'm only one person and that's why I agree with John Day's point mm. that they should be investing in the larger kind of scheme where they can actually empower people so maybe sponsoring people to do the work that they can't do, Yeah. Mm. you know, and because that will allow them to reach more people and they can still do these, you know, do these programs so I believe it's a hybrid approach. Mm. Some people need the opportunity, some people just need to be empowered so they can go and do whatever they want to do. Mm. So, yeah, more obligation to just empower people. I mean, it makes a lot of sense to me. Mm, actually, you guys kind of segue that into a nice little thing I'd like to go into this. So, why don't you just tell the guys about things you're doing to empower um, the community and just give a little background for life before the start the stuff from the right? Yeah, sure. I was on <laughs> What am, I, what am I even doing? I mean, since while I was at uni, I did a, a lot of stuff like obviously around Bristol's new bank, and that was about just providing a platform for black students to create the content that they didn't really see on campus. Also, gave them the opportunity to work better with the black community in Bristol because when you go to a lot of universities or university cities and stuff, you're actually quite isolated from everything, everything that's going on around you. So, with Bristol, like the universities on the top hill in Clifton which is like the wealthiest part of the city and you don't really get to know what else is out there and there's like a whole community that are doing incredible work so that's kind of what I did um, and it was great and those people found mentors in the community loads of people found work found organizations to volunteer for and so as well as students getting something in the community got something from students being active and, and just involved in their organizations and we had like a radio show, we did video content, we did articles, we helped to collaborate on like festivals and stuff. So it was like really hands on, really interesting, just fun work. Now, I'm a bit rubbish now, like I'm really <laughs> confident. I think you kind of graduate and you're like, wow, like if there's a whole life out mm -hmm. here that I need to manage for myself, what the hell? Um, and so, yeah, I guess obviously I try to write things that are empowering, representative, informative. I can definitely be doing a lot more, like I would love to maybe like mentor people or just find some way to kind of give back with the skills and knowledge and connections that I have. Like at the moment, I'm kind of just 
worked on trying to just establish myself like as an individual like, in this world, you know what I mean? And yeah. just like working and finding finding what's right for me. Because you kind of you're in uni and everything up until uni has in a way been decided for you because it's the status quo it's what you do. Mm-hmm. And then like you graduate and there's like no rules to it. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes I feel like for me personally for a lot of people I feel like you should just graduate and you should just figure out like what the hell is it that like, you want to do, want to contribute to this world, want to yeah. gain for yourself, and then build on that and then figure out how to give back. Because you can't give back if you're empty yourself. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, for me, I tried to, I definitely echo what Shanti said, like, um, I had to kind of establish myself and what I wanted to do first before I felt I had the voice to start to give back. Um, so everything I tried to do, I tried to make sure there's some kind of like social impact or benefit for the community or culturally. Um, so one of the main things that I do is I, I co-run this um, organisation called the Law Collective, which basically provides a safe space for young black lawyers to connect with each other. We're up to like 250, 300 black lawyers across the city and across the world now actually. Um, and outside of that we also have a whole network of students that we assist as well. So we've got hundreds of students on like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and we just kind of connect those students with this network of black lawyers, so lawyers of African and Caribbean descent um, at the firms, organisations, chambers and um, businesses that they are looking to apply to. So they have someone that's kind of been through similar experiences to them, not always the same experience and sometimes or quite often can better relate to what they're going through and what they're looking to do than a lot of the people in those organisations um, if they went to them directly. So that's the main thing I do from a kind of community perspective. Also um, um, on the committee of the British Nigerian Law Forum, so we assist um, Nigerian lawyers and British lawyers of Nigerian descent. Um, so I co-head the junior lawyers division for that both here and in Nigeria. Um, and then outside of that, just do a few other kind of community related things as well, both in the kind of corporate space and in the creative space as well. Nice. I told you the Mongols, guys. Uh, finally, George. Yeah, so this year I'm taking a year out of, of UCR and mainly just working on three things to empower young people. So the first is raising a million pounds for Amos Bursary because I joined in 2014, completely transformed my life, my mindset, the way I do things and life of many others as well. So my brother got a full tuition scholarship from there. I got a scholarship from there. We're just you know brotherhood and I think more people need to be able to see that or be part of that. So this one million pound will hopefully sustain it for the years, you know, five years going forward. And it's all about celebrating the successes of the students so far. So as we were talking about the media, making sure we change the narrative so people feel that we actually belong in these environments. And the second thing is motives. So that was because we realised people were always asking what's the motive today and what is there to do? And we were like, hey, there's a lot of cool things out there to do outside of entertainment. Let us show you where they are. So that's all about providing events and opportunities in and around London, hopefully around the UK in the next time of three years. We'll see how it goes. And then Slingshot, which is again about accessing opportunities, internships, because we saw people want internships but they don't know how to get it, so they need coaching. I received coaching for every single internship I've had, yeah. so there's no coincidence there and I want, because I have received an unfair advantage, you know, per se, I want other people to have that chance as well, but I do it at scale and not everyone coming to me for everything that I've done, so yeah, so yeah that's the kind of vision for me this year. Oh, thank you guys for sharing, man, like you can see how inspirational it is to see people just making moves and really pushing forward man and like even us graduating we feel like we could just do more where we set up the video series and bring voices together and that wraps up this episode guys so thank you so much for watching it's been a great one it's a last episode for the series so we really hope you enjoyed it rather not uh, make sure you look at all the things they're doing as they're going forward we'll include information below as you can find make sure you hit the L button and the S button do all of that jazz and, and uh, and <laughs> <laughs>